Well, we're talking about the vocabulary in um, Unit 5 on page 129 in Hansen and Quinn. Um, let's take a look at the verbs first. Oh, but before we do that, there's something we forgot in our video about the articular infinitive, about the gerund. We forgot to tell you how to negate them. And the negative of a gerund is not u but me. So, so tablopsi, for example, that's the aorist infinitive of the verb blopto, that means harm. Tablopsi means harming. Okay, harming animals is cruel. Okay, that harming. And tame blopsi is going to be not harming. Uh, friends is a good thing. <laughs> okay, so let's remember that one. All right, M moving back onto the list of vocabulary words. Let's talk about the new verbs in this lesson. The first one is that one that we just looked at, the verb blopto, um, and its principal parts. Um, the underlying root there is blab, B-L-A-B, okay, which means harm. There's a noun, blabe, as I mentioned the other day. So we got blopto, blopso, eblopsa, beblafa. You've got a perfect with an aspirated, uh, final aspirated consonant. The B has become a phi. Beblamai, there's your perfect passive, eblabain or eblafain. It has both uh, an aorist passive with and without the theta. Um, nothing complicated about what it means. There's also the verb archo, um, which means two things, at least at the moment. It's going to mean a third thing once we get to lesson eight, six, seven, rather. Um, it means rule or command. Um, it also means begin. And that's because the, the underlying meaning of this verb is to be first. Okay, so the person who's first is in charge and rules, um, but also is also the person who begins. Um, the, the, the most important thing about it is that it governs a direct object in the genitive case because it did mean be first. So it meant be first of a group, right? Mm -hmm. And then that explains why you begin with a genitive object, okay? Um, so it originally made sense, it doesn't anymore. Um, the principal parts are pretty straightforward. Archo, arxo, erxa, um, ercha, with an aspirated final consonant, it's already aspirated. Ergmai um, is your perfect passive, and erchtein for the aorist passive with a theta, eta. Now we can learn all the principal parts because we've had them all, mm -hmm. okay? So it's time to get them under control. Um, the, uh, there are two more verbs in this lesson. There's petho, um, which means persuade. Petho, peso, epesa. The theta becomes an, a sigma when it's followed by an s. Um, so it's pesa, petho, peso, epesa. Pepe, ka. There's no theta or sigma. Pepe, smai. It comes back. And that pace thing. Um, very, very... Uh, uh, common verb in Greek. Greeks are really interested in and obsessed even with the notion of persuasion, an important concept in the society. Um, and the last one is the verb prato, which has a long alpha. Okay, um, prato. The underlying uh, root here is prog, P-R-A-G, um, and we, this is what we have in words like pragmatic and practical. The, the gamma becomes a kappa before a t, so that's why it's prac with a k or a c in English uh, in, in those other places. So this verb is translated as do or fair, f-a-r-e. Fair is, I don't think, uh, a, a living word in normal English. Mm -hmm. We do have it in, in phrases like seafaring, and the original meaning of this verb um, means to traverse the sea, actually. It means to, to, to succeed in crossing over uh, spa uh, watery space, okay? And that's the original meaning. It, doesn't, it means that in some very old texts, okay? But it gets generalized into something like do or anything. The reason that people want you to learn the meaning fair is that if you use it with an adverb like L, E-U, as the circumflex over the U, which means well, you can say L prato means I'm doing well, I'm faring well, okay? I'm still not convinced that that's the thing that you actually say, but that's, that's the excuse. All right, so the principal parts are based on the gamma 
and uh, ending of the root procto is weird. The, there's no gamma there, but that's what happens when you add the y, original yo suffix to make verbs. In Attic Greek, you have procto. In regular Greek, it's proso. And then it's proxo with a xi, epraxa, pepracha, so you've aspirated the gamma to a chi, as we've seen in other cases, or pepraga without the aspiration. One become, when you have two, okay, they change in function. One's transitive, pepracha, and the other's intransitive, pepraga. Uh, that's the meaning fair is intransitive. Okay. Which means it takes a direct object. Yes, if exactly. It's if it's transitive, it takes it's it's do something to somebody. Okay, uh, even can take. Well, well, we'll talk about that some other time. And then there's pepragmai, the the perfect passive. I was done wrong. Okay, that kind of do, do in the passive. And the prachthane, the aorist passive form. All right. Um, those are the verbs in this lesson. Let's talk about um, some of the nouns and adjectives. Um, we get the now important noun in Greek, doxa, uh, wh whose meanings are complex. Doxa, the genitive is doxes. That's a short alpha noun, like a thalata type noun. Um, it's feminine. And it means, the book tells you it means expectation, belief, reputation, and glory. So it really means, um, in the, the first meaning that here is expectation or belief, is it means opinion. Um, as opposed to knowledge, okay? It means things that people think or that are apparently true, but not necessarily, okay? So it's a non-absolute kind of knowledge. Um, but it also, the older meaning of this word is glory uh, and, and fame, okay? And good reputation. Um, we get the noun for death in Greek, thanatos, which I think it survives in English in the name of a famous poem that kids used to memorize in school, Thanatopsis. You ever learned this one? Mm -hmm. No? Okay, <laughs> anyhow. I can't remember who, who wrote this, but um, there aren't many cognates of this word, but it gives us, more importantly, you know, it gives us the noun death, but more importantly, the two-termination adjective athanatos. As you know, Greeks believed that, you know, and called their gods the immortal ones. So athanatos can mean a divinity just by itself. Or hoi athanatoi can mean the collection of the divinities, but it's an adjective that doesn't have a separate feminine gender. Okay, that means immortal, um, but the the one that looks masculine is both masculine and feminine. The one that looks neuter is neuter. Okay. Um, there's another adjective that immediately after it, hieros, hiera, hieron, means holy or sacred. Okay. Um, it's it's a you know there's a lot of sacred things in daily life in Greek there there isn't the kind of rigorous um, distinction that we make between what's sacred and what's profane everything is sacred in in the right context in Greek daily life um, so but the important thing about this adjective is that it governs a, a complement in the in the genitive case as opposed to the dative so we're used to saying it's sacred to me, or it's sacred to a particular god, okay? And we, we, you would think that you would have a dative, but in, in Greek you use a genitive for that case. So you put the god to whom something is sacred in the genitive's case, not in the dative. Um, we, we get uh, also the, there, there are some interesting nouns here. There's the noun hippos, okay? It's, it's got two P's in it. Um, this, is, uh, this is the Indo-European word for horse. Um, if you know Latin, it's the same word as Latin, equus. It's got two P's because people like their horses. It's like the two P's in puppy or daddy or, you know, th those kinds of doubling of consonants that expresses affection for something. Um, and uh, notice that it's like the os, okay? It can be of either masculine or feminine gender. So you have to watch, okay? Sometimes it means any a horse of no particular gender. Sometimes it means a stallion. And sometimes it means a mare. You remember our triangle with the genders, okay? So a hawk can be either masculine or feminine, actually, just a horse. Um, and then you can use the two genders to distinguish between them. Um, there are some other nouns. There's one that 
there's the, the word for stone, lethos, kindunos, that means danger, it has no cognates in English. There are the adjectives makros, which means large or long, and mikros, which means small or short, okay? Um, as in macroeconomics and microeconomics, we have a lot of compounds of those in English. Um, here's one, uh, two, there are two last things we want to make remarks about. One is the adjective derived from the noun polymos. We have the noun polymos, polemu, ha, that means war. You already know that. But this lesson teaches you the adjective polemios, polemia, polemion. You have an alpha there because of the iota before the gender. Uh, um, before the uh, grammatical ending, um, and it, the book translates it hostile, or it means warlike, okay, um, derived from the, an adjective derived from the noun for war, but it occurs more often than not with uh, an, a nominative plur or a plural uh, article in front of it. it, doesn't have to be nominative, as in hoi polemioi, and this is a this is a uh, I gotcha. It, it's it it looks like that means the the hostile ones, okay? And according to the use of the article that we learned a few in, in the video about the new uses of the article, that's what it should mean. But it doesn't, okay? What it means is the collection of people who are hostile to you. In other words, the enemy in the singular, okay? It's a collective noun like the noun people in English. Okay, and, and you know, it's not that it grammatically governs a singular verb, but it does mean a, collect, a single collection of many enemies, okay? Not the hostile ones, all right? And you're going to see the book loves that expression and likes to catch you up on it. All right, um, last, last thing is protos, the adjective protos, which has lots of derivatives in English as in protozoan and prototype and all those things. Um, protos, prote, proton, it can be, uh, th has three genders. Um, and one of the things that's curious and uh, important about it is that it often is um, used in the predicate uh, in Greek without an article in front of it. So the standard uh, example of it is in the expression protos efe, F-A is the word for he, she, or it said, okay? So that, that looks like it means he first said, or sh, because it's masculine, protos, F-A. But what it actually means is he was the first to speak, okay? He spoke first is another way of doing it. There you can see that it goes in the predicate. But this is, this is a common construction with protos and a few other adjectives. Um, that that it goes in the predicate of the sentence instead of in the in the subject as it modify when it modifies the subject. All right. I think that's it. Hi. Bye bye.